Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Claire. I'm the event coordinator at Village Books in Bellingham and Linden, Washington, and I'm delighted to be hosting this evening's event. Um, we're here this evening to celebrate the publication of our latest Chuck and Nut Editions title at Village Books, uh, Tales from the Pandemic, A Modern Decameron. Mm -hmm. So first we are going to hear from Richard Pierce Moses. Take it away, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so Village Books has hosted uh, in the before times a, write, a couple of writing groups. And this group met on the second and fourth Thursdays. And with the lockdown, we all went into Zoom. Uh, about a month into the lockdown, the writing group started getting together on Zoom to socialize. We were lonely. And I suggested that the group write stories, quote, to entertain and distract during a time of isolation in the spirit of Boccaccio's Decameron. This group really rallied, and the result is this anthology, eclectic stories as diverse as the authors. And now I want to turn it over to our MC for tonight, David Bonio, who's the co-editor of the book. David? Thank you so much, Richard. I'll just be moving people along. I will say, for example, Molly, you will be our first reader, and then on deck will be Ken Meyer. Um, that will be how I announce people as we go through. Uh, people will read for about five minutes max. Um, most of them will be a little bit under that because it's always nice to leave everyone wanting a little bit more. Um, and so without further ado, Molly, if you would take it away. Sure. This is from a story called Bees. Let's all sit down, said her mother, with a trace of the gracious hostess voice she used when her bridge club met in the living room. Sophie, you in the armchair. The boys on the love seat. Andrew and I will be on the sofa. Everyone took a place, struck silent by the abnormality of the proceedings. The 60th television was in the family room. There was no reason for the whole family to be taken within the living room. Her father glared around as if he had assembled a hostile crowd. He was looking at the two boys fidgeting on the love seat. He seemed to be addressing them rather than Sophie. I'm sorry to say that your sister has been spreading a dangerous rumor. I had a call from Harry Ogilvy late this afternoon. I didn't ask, who's Harry Ogilvy? Harry Ogilvy is the father of Sophia's friend, Madison. This afternoon, Sophia told Madison a very frightening story. Sophia said that there was some new, um, Bugs, said Melissa, but flying insects, very large ones, giant flying insects. Shit, said Aiden, and got a stern look from his father. Yes, it's a scary idea. You can see how it could make people very worried. Furthermore, these insects are supposed to have very um, large stingers. Imagine if that were really happening. I don't see why anyone would worry, said their mother. They're just big bees. We had big black bees at the summer house three or four years ago. They just burrowed into the wood around the door, and never bit anybody, just chased away the wasps and yellow jackets. I kind of got to like them. Sophie wasn't talking about those bees, her father said. The ones I were talking about are hornets, said Sophie. Some people call them murder hornets. Cool, said Nick. Their father scowled. Just listen to that name, murder hornets. I happen to know they're getting a lot of publicity some places, not legitimate places. Those internet sites, probably black sites. Some of the tech guys in the office are talking about them. The sites, the bees, both. Tech guys are supposed to be smart, but you know, they don't have common sense. That's what's important when you hear stories about insects murdering somebody, common sense. Nick inched forward on the love seat. Like, they're really supposed to murder people? Sometimes they kill people, Sophie said helpfully. Although I've only seen videos of them stinging rats to death, they definitely kill rats. Her father said, think about it, young lady. Doesn't that sound like science fiction? I mean, presuming there are these hornets, and even that they're bigger than uh, normal, 
we know no flying insects that carry that kind of menace for human beings or even their pets. So science fiction, where a lot of, where a few new bit bugs show up around here and people begin to get hysterical. You should know better than to believe them. Aiden cleared his throat. It's more like fantasy, actually. You see, there's science fiction and then there's fantasy. They're alike in some ways, but they're also different. For instance, science fiction would be more like big hornets from outer space. That would be amazing, said Nick. They're not from outer space, said the father, although I wouldn't be too surprised if some of the so-called scientists we hear from decided to claim they were. You can't believe stuff that you read on the internet. Good God, it's the very definition of, of fake silence, science. Melissa clasped his shoulder. What kind of scientists, Andrew? I don't know, bug specialists. Entomologists, said Sophie. Melissa sighed. Honey, you've really got to stop reading all that nonsense. Your father and I are worried you're going down the, you know, wrong path. I read articles, said Sophie. I'm not planning to be a prostitute. Watch your mouth, said her father. Thank you so very much, Molly. Up next, we have Ken Meyer, and on deck is Diane Meyer. Hi, everybody. I'm especially pleased to be here today because the last reading I was supposed to be at, which was What Come Rise, I got the, uh, the time wrong and showed up an hour late, just as the moderator was saying, and we want to thank everybody for coming. So anyway, I'm very happy to have the time right. But anyway, okay, my story is called Lisa Pandian at Steamworks Brewery. Some of you may know that actually is a brewery up in Vancouver. And the story is set in the future and a fugitive from the US, Lisa Pandian has gone over the border and a Department of Justice lawyer, Carl has gone to try and convince her to come back and face her charges and face justice, et cetera. And also with them, at this meeting are two students. So they're meeting in this brewery. So her visitor was collecting his thoughts, but Lisa forged ahead anyway. You know, we both studied overseas. You went to Japan, I went to China. At the beginning of this century, the policymakers talked about convergence. It was usually taken to mean China would gradually become like the various democracies around the world. The wise men never in a million years thought that the opposite would occur, that the US would become like China, a one party repressive state. Lisa said, Carl, you know well, the other parties still exist and are functioning. Yeah, Mr. Berenger's right, said Charles. Yes, but they're cowed, heckled and splintered, reposted Lisa. But I'd really like to refer to something Confucius pointed out. Confucius, thought Carl. He said, continued Lisa, names needed to be rectified or everything will fall into confusion. Names need to denote what is actually happening. We just touched on two examples. This is earlier in their conversation. We talked about two examples of actions identified mis by misleading or utterly false names, administrative measures and suspending passports. And I'd also make a point about so-called originalism. This referred, as I'm sure the audience knows, this referred to the legal philosophy advocated by the long deceased Supreme Court Justice Scalia and contemporary like-minded souls that championed following the original intent of the founding fathers and close adherence to the sense of the constitution in its day. The two <laughs> students who were with these two people were the most attentive they had been since Carl walked down the stairs. The appellation originalist has been taken over by individuals with a certain viewpoint, continued Lisa, but I consider myself to be an originalist too. Carl went, hmm. My understanding of the constitution encompasses acknowledgement of women's rights, no discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and so forth. My understanding welcomes evolution of legislation consonant with the needs of each generation as recommended by Thomas Jefferson. Well, you know, that might be neo-originalism, neo said Carl. But your friends arguing from that viewpoint before the Supreme Court have been rebuffed repeatedly. In fact, I might point out to you, two of them are behind bars at this time. 
Well, I dare say they shouldn't be, said Lisa. And as you know, Carl charged ahead, the sentiment of Jefferson you applaud was contained in a letter. It's not in the Constitution. That's a point for Mr. Berenger, suggested the student named Charles. Yes, but he's still a founding father, isn't he? Suggested Lisa gently. No one has renamed him yet. She turned again to the two students, not without self-mockery. Isn't this exciting? Two lawyers having a chat. And that's my excerpt, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. I, I hope my father, who was a lawyer for many decades, enjoyed that. Uh, Diane, you're up next. And Richard, you are on deck. Hello, I'm Diane, and this is Ira's story. The Arizona State Highway crosses a dry riverbed, cuts between two dry hills, scrabbles up a mountain. Just below the crest, the mountain swallows the road, and with it, my 10-year-old Plymouth Valiant, and inside the car, me, Ira Stone. I'm 28, a late bloomer with a diploma, Bachelor of Science in Accounting, dated May 11, 1987 days ago. The mountain spits me and the valiant out the other side. We descend into the little town, Pyrite. I will work as Pyrite's acting finance director for a year, courtesy the CETA jobs program. CETA, Nixon's Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. It allocates federal money to states and local governments for hiring disadvantaged, overlooked, not first tier choice hires and we will do work that otherwise would be left undone. Professor Altschuler was so pleased by my good fortune. You played the system, got your state-sponsored education. Here, now you go west and take over the tank town. Smart man, Ira. On the map, it didn't look so far. Just a wiggly line angled down to the left. Obviously, I would save plenty on gas. Just aim the car, coast downhill, so wrong. Now I don't feel smart. What do I feel? Panic. The air has no air in it at this elevation. Some chemical reaction between my sweat and the car upholstery stained the back of my shirt the color of iodine. Also, my left arm throbs, scalded red from four days, cocked on the driver's side window, no air conditioning. Monday's my start date. Right now, Friday, I need food, a place to shower, sleep, live. At the bottom of the hill, I park outside a realty company, which, the owner and sole occupant explains does not handle rentals. Nobody handles rentals. So how do you find a place to live? Ask around, I suppose. Where can I buy lunch? Ructions is open now, up two blocks, can't miss it, hon. Music, country western, spills out the door and onto the sidewalk at Ructions. If you're waiting on me, you're backing up. Who's singing, I ask the bartender. Royce and Jeannie Kendall, what do you have? steak and eggs and hash browns, a beer, a bud, and a couple glasses of water, he leaves. I learn more about his musical taste when he returns and slides the plate and glasses and bottles of hot sauce across the counter. He catches sight of my left arm, his eyebrows go back, our eyes meet. New York, I thought the drive would be easy, four days. Ah, how long you plan to visit? I have a job offer. Bullshit, there aren't any jobs. Sorry to hear that. He returns to the kitchen. I land on the hash browns and watch him maneuver a mop over the floor. He wipes his hands down his apron, strolls up again. I'm curious, where's this job you think we have? City Hall. Ha <laughs> ha, backbiting, scandals, turnover, an election coming up. That's the good news, the bad news. The swamp cooler is broken. And my funding ends next year. Right now, I need that first real job. Also somewhere to live, any ideas? No. You solo, right? He leans closer. A friend of mine, Maura. Her sister Jenny moved out last month. Maura might rent her Jenny's studio, the half basement. Nice old place on the hillside, windows, separate entrance, interested? Sure. Here, he raises his apron, polishes his hands, flips my guest check over, sketches a map. Tell Maura, Steve from Ruction sent you. He pockets his tip. We shake hands. And I've got a tip for you. Maura doesn't date, you know, men. Hey, let me know how it goes. When I drive up, Maura, barefoot, crew cut kimono is waiting. We strike a deal. She even gives me the okay to share her kitchen. 
tells me to hustle off to the MVD office next town over, buy an Arizona license plate quick before the counter closes for the weekend, and don't drive off till you've replaced it. She loans me a screwdriver and pliers because that New York plate puts a target on your back, Ira. Thank you so very much. Thank Richard, you. you're, up, you're up and then Kim, you are on deck. Oh, thanks. Uh, my story is the new abnormal. It's about members of an online trivia team, the Quirks. Two members, Noah and Ted, are longtime friends. Ted has recently been released from the hospital after being very sick. Noah knocked on Ted's door and used his key to let himself in. Galena greeted him at the door. Good to be home, huh? He asked, scratching the cat behind the ears. Noah, Ted called from the kitchen. You were expecting someone else? A little early to be on Grinder, don't you think? What? And deprive the world of this? Ted camped a glamour pose. Speaking of which, got you supplies at the Swingle Safeway. Not that anyone's been cruising there for years. Noah put bags of food on the counter and helped Ted put things away. Ted held up a jar of spaghetti sauce. How sweet of you to remember. The first thing you ever said to me was, what do you prefer, ragu or prego? And the first thing you said to me was, your place or mine? Now sit, he told Ted. I can do this and you're obviously tired. It's gonna take more than a couple of weeks for you to get your strength back. Ted steadied himself with a hand on the table as he slowly sank into the chair. If I ever do, every day in every way, F this shit. It's been a month since I got home and I'm still tired. If you're looking for Pollyanna to cheer you up, you're out of luck. You're wicked and mean, but I love you just the same, Ted said. I'm right there with you. We've grown old together, an old married couple who were never married. Noah grabbed the coffee pot. Refill? Ted held out his mug with a shaky hand. Saw the news this morning that the vaccines aren't the miracle everyone was hoping for. Helps those who get it, but most people may have to wait a year. Guess those of us at risk aren't getting out of isolation anytime soon. At least you've got a cat, but you're right. Looks like we're gonna be stuck in bubbles for a long time. So who's this Bobo fellow from Trivia, Ted asked. You two were really ragging Harold last night. On the Bo Smart team, old friend of Harold's, he found out I made Harold's masks and asked about getting some. Came up for a beer with Harold a couple of months ago. A kindred spirit with amazing energy. Nice to tap into that. We've gotten together for a beer a couple of times. Sounds better than a cat, Ted said. Actually, I may be the cat. Huh? Bobo asked me if I wanted to join his bubble. He offered to let me move into the guest house at his place, little mother-in-law cottage behind the backyard. Smaller than my apartment, but there's a great garden. Saves me money and they get some rent. Ted put his mug down. You said he had a family. What do they think? He's had me down to his place a few times. Jenny, his wife, is amazing. Hint of Earth Mother. Works for the Department of Ecology some sort of programming data analyst position. Son and a daughter, middle and high school, they've got their mother's smarts and their father's mischievousness. I've been helping them with their classes. They started calling me their fairy godfather. You should see them bragging to their friends. Sounds nice, but where does that leave me, Ted asked. I don't follow. You're leaving my bubble for theirs. Noah reached out for Ted's hand. Nope. Never gonna happen, you were part of the deal. You'll be part of the bubble if you want. He knows you and I are sons of different mothers. They're, they're not too worried. I only got out of the hospital a few weeks ago, not to mention we've never even met. Actually, Bobo suggested it and he's heard stories about us. He knows you've been isolating, so COVID's not the issue. His wife agreed, not worried about that fungus either. It's really rare and if they caught it, the docs would know to look for it. So you're really gonna move? When, Ted asked. Last weekend, and you're invited for New Year's Eve. Thank you so much, Richard. Next up is Kim, and on deck is Vaughn. Hi, my, I'm Kim, and uh, my story is a tale of two women in a pandemic. 
the mother. She wished for what felt like the millionth time for him to stop moving, a tornado rushing through the house, whirling here and there, topping, toppling and building simultaneously, the sound of feet tapping and a voice answering its own questions until he stopped and looked to her for an answer, an answer to burning questions about how things fit or to a rumbling stomach or a broken toy. Motherhood could be exhausting. Not that she saw her son as exhausting. She loved him, of course, but the days did drag on and fall was coming, coming fast with more days of whirling, tumbling, stomping, always moving feet and voice, days stuck inside with no end in sight. Five minutes, she thought, I want five minutes for me. She remembered a story she had heard recently on NPR about education pods. Was that what they were calling it? Well, it didn't really matter, she realized. It would give her those five minutes and let someone else share their expertise and she could share her expertise. What expertise did she have? Legal advice for five-year-olds? She read the parenting books, but still felt so lost as how to parent. She'd always, left, she'd always left education up to those who knew more about kids, like Nanny. Now she was a gym. It had been a stretch for them to hire her. Both she and her husband made decent money, but even so, the $2,000 a month was hard to swallow. It took over half her salary, making her wonder if it would be better if she stayed home but she loved her job, so she kept working. She knew if she took off for a few years, it would be that much harder to find the job. She'd be behind in the work world by then. She put her laptop down on the coffee table in the room. Wanna come watch Wild Crabs? That would keep him quiet while she worked and did some research on these pots, as well as some real work. She was getting behind. He came in, dragging his hand-knit fox behind him. It had been a gift from Nanny. Mother smiled at the sight of him. He was a mess with blueberry yogurt from breakfast still covering his face, and his hair jumbled as if clumps were each trying to escape his head in different directions. His bangs aimed for the ground, partially obscuring his amber-colored eyes. He curled up next to her and looked up at her. She brushed his bangs to the side, and she kissed him on the forehead. A haircut to free those eyes would have to wait until after the pandemic. He smiled at her. She relaxed, deciding her research could wait and curled her arms around him, forgetting about his Tasmanian devil ways for a few moments. His partner in crime, a black lab named Gizmo, jumped up beside them. Gizmo and I made you into a sandwich. We're the bread and you're the peanut butter and jelly, she said, laughing and turning the TV on for him. He giggled. I can't be two things. I'm just a tomato. That's my favorite sandwich. Tomato with nothing else. He was sure always to be specific about his tastes. He had developed tastes of his own lately, about food, clothes, Bath water temperature, bedtime, the list could go on. At times, it felt to her that it was all designed to test her resolve. She picked up her computer and typed an education pod. A dozen links came up, which she opened and read. Feeling that she had enough of a handle on the subject, she emailed friends to see if they would want to be part of it. Good morning. You all survive another day in lockdown? We may get out for a bit of a hike later, but we'll see. I have a ton of work to get done, and Annie took the day off. I'm so lost without her. I heard a story about education pods on NPR, and it sounds like it would be a great thing. I really don't want to send him back to school if they open in person, and online didn't work for him. I know you all had similar experiences. An education pod might work best for all of us. We could each take a day to teach, focus on our strengths, and the kids could learn from each other. I see it as our own little school in the suburbs, kind of like the one in Little House on the Prairie, where different ages all learn together, LOL. We could even hire a teacher if we want. I think our nanny would be interested in helping out as an assistant. And we all have flexible enough jobs that we could swing a four day work week. Lord knows I could get more done if I had a day to myself. Thank you. And that's my ex excerpt. Thank you so much, Kim. Next up we have Vaughn and on deck we have Tom. All right, um, my name is Vaughn and my story is titled Drift Forever. On the night before the return, Miriam Sarkeesian was thinking about her family as the International Space Station passed over the United States. They would be passing over Burbank any second now. She'd wave down to them, her mom, dad, sister, her husband, and hope they were all safe, wearing their masks, and were most importantly, healthy. Mission Control assured them that they would be returning safely, but with the addendum that things would be different. That's what kept Miriam awake the nights leading up to the return, the notion of difference. When she had embarked on their journey back in when she had embarked on their journey back in October, Miriam had such a feeling of elation. 
After months of preparation and simulations, she was on her way into the unending frontier, outer space. She knew what to expect from the mission, but she'd still hoped deep down that there would be some kind of sci-fi wonderment to the experience. She didn't think that the sci-fi element of it would be taking place back on Earth, however. Be careful what you wish for. They had already been up for longer than planned, three extra weeks, a consideration for their safety, the Dalgo at Control had told them through his face mask. They were extending it again for another three week stretch, pushing their tenure just past the eight month mark, further rattling the three scientists. Will we be drifting forever? She couldn't shake the nauseous fear at the prospect of another extension. And won't the continued extensions just make their already weakened immune systems even more subject to the germ? <clears throat> the germ. The lead into a story of post-apocalyptia, Miriam thought time and time again as she followed its rapid progress. They had first heard news of the germ around three months into their study. It'll just be another swine flu. Remember back in 10, Gregory Beatty had said confidently when Hidalgo had first told them about it and the potential for the germ's rapid transfer. It won't amount to anything, just media hype. The problem with Gregory, Miriam thought of her colleague, was that while he excelled in his field, he seemed to know little outside of it, yet held on to a swaggering confidence, even though he might be wrong. Thankfully for Miriam, control seemed to take little stock in his ambivalence and said to take caution and be weary. It'll be gone before we know it. Gregory had said after the transmission. As the days progressed into weeks, the crew watched in horrified disbelief as the germ spread from person to person, household to household, town to town, city to city, country to country, leaping oceans and climbing mountains with ferocity, weakening the healthy and killing the weak. People were dying in mass, people they knew, people they didn't know. Miriam could almost feel it reaching up for her like an invisible hand, fingers brushing the exterior of the station as it made its rotations, leaving her with a knot in her stomach and anxiety-ridden night terrors. The germ had engulfed the world. And I'm gonna end it there, thank you. Thank you so much. Our next reader is Tom and then on deck is me. Well, hello. Everybody can hear me, yeah, hi. Um, so this is from my piece, Tiny Errors, which when this project was first proposed, I struggled with coming up with anything. And I did this little project where I was sending postcards out to people. And I found this really random old postcard. So I just wrote, hey, I'm trapped in the past, et cetera. And it's this little tiny story. And then I was just like, oh, there it is. So this is Tiny Errors. Thinking things through had always been a problem for Noble. He did better with collaborators who could point out various unintended consequences. He was a big picture type. Others were better at seeing the small stuff. Being of that super small subset of humans who could be called genius, he had built the time machine out of boredom during the quarantine. He liked to travel and was an avid fan of history. Throwing himself into the project, he stopped almost all contact with his staff. Deliveries piled up at his door, emails went unread, the phone was shut off to prevent distraction. Deciding which way to travel was easy. The future just seemed like a bad idea given the outlook and the past looked like more fun. Having been tested, and found negative prior to lockdown, he wasn't worried about dragging the plague along on his trip. Having lost track of present time while he constructed his device, he started to look forward to getting out of the house. The design of the device was a tip of the cap to Doctor Who and a bit of a fuck you to Steve Jobs' sleep playthings. It looked like an exceptionally tall electric transformer box. Primer gray, covered with various yellow caution stickers he had printed out. For fun, he also sprayed a few graffiti tags to make it seem less out of place on the street. The tags really made it seem ordinary. 
Inside was nothing fancy, nothing like a TARDIS. It was a box with touch screens, toggle switches, and dials with some LED lights on the ceiling. The platform he would stand on was the where the actual mechanism operated. Noble was excited to visit the past. So much had changed so quickly that he felt it would be interesting to see that time with a fresh eye. That great disruption of the tech revolution had upended and broken things with such efficacy that there was bound to be some forgotten jewels to exploit. The idea of some new venture would, had started to bothering him for quite some time. He was bored with his company and used to having big ideas to play with, but now he was stuck at how everything seemed to have been done. Thought of being left behind nagged him. Building the time machine made his ennui apparent. The device had no real commercial prospects. No matter what, somebody would find to use it as a way to kill Hitler. And then no one knew better than to try and change the past. But using it to jumpstart his present would be harmless. And thank you very much. That's my piece. Thank you so much. Next up is me. And then on deck will be last, but by no means the least, Raj. This is my story, Masquerade. The last two and a half years have given him the COVID-20 and then some. So he goes thrift shopping one week before his community's first tango social post-quarantine. He brings his own clothes that no longer fit him, carefully culled from the very stores he now browses, to exchange for credit. The musk of secondhand clothing permeates his math. Maybe one in four of the other customers also wear face covering, which makes sense since both the national and state mandates have long since been lifted. Now most people wear them only when they feel sick, but he likes to be more cautious and he suspects others do too. Keeping six feet away from others is also a new polite habit, even though the signs encouraging it have long been taken down. Every pair of dress pants that might fit winds up in his arm. He carries them over to the fitting room, marveling that he can use a fitting room. He's pleased to see that the employee at the counter wears a mask. He deposits the pants, tamping down his eagerness to try them on now. Instead, he squeezes a pump of hand sanitizer over his palms and then forays back to the rack to pick out dress shirts. Dark colors are a favorite. Friends always say he's too pale for pastels, and after all that time bleached even whiter by screens, he's not ready for anything that would even hint at him being washed out after so much time indoors. Looking at the tight-fitting undershirt he wore to test these clothes out, he realizes that it too will need to be replaced. Three basic Hanes shirts answer his call, all placed in slightly different areas along the shirt rack instead of grouped together as one might expect. At the end, he has three new pairs of dress pants, two white undershirts, a black undershirt, and four new button-ups, the price of which is a dark forest green. He always dreamed of finding a green shirt like this ever since an old dance partner said he'd look good in this color, and it feels like kismet to have found it this time. Better late than never, he supposes. The next order of business is a haircut. Six months in, the barbers had reopened, but what was the point of putting himself and others at risk when no one would be close enough to see if his hair was a little uneven? He couldn't stand that awkward phase where hair started growing over his ears, so he just went into his backyard and cut his hair there. He was surprised that all of the videos he could find online for men's home haircuts just talked about using electric clippers, which was a little bit too close of a shave for him. Still, his hair looked good enough in all the video calls that stood in for normal human connection. Now that people will see him in person, he feels nervous elation to be back at his favorite barber, not sure what it will be like to sit indoors for so long. He writes his name on a clipboard, and almost no time passes before he's called. The touch of the stylist causes an involuntary flinch. He wills himself to be still, forces his muscles to relax. First haircut since the quarantine, she asks, her voice gentle. He asks if it's that obvious. That's all right, honey. We'll have you all cleaned up in no time. She taps the strings that secure her own mask to her face. This'll need to come off. 
She's wearing a mask, so that should be okay. But still, they're inside. He knows he can't expect her to cut around the mask, so he takes it off, wondering if his smile still looks natural. That's better. She's so at ease as she moves around him, her fingers combing through the uneven strands of his hair and bringing it all closer to his temples. He feels muscles that he didn't realize had seized up start to relax at this human touch. His hair is still short, so it doesn't take long. It's disappointing when the blow dryer comes out, but the feeling of loose hair blowing off of him leaves him feeling strangely clean. She ruffles his hair when done, and he blinks several times before he's sure he won't cry. And again, the final piece of the night will be read by Raj. And then if anyone has any questions about any of the writing or the process of putting together an anthology, we'll be happy to answer it. But before that, Raj, please take it away with your delightful story. All right, thanks, David. All right, my story is titled A Walk in the Desert. <clears throat> Standing six feet from the person behind and in front of him, David eagerly waited for his chance to enter the animal shelter after the doors opened. This was the third shelter he'd queued at in as many days. At each one, he left empty-handed, but convinced himself that shelters running out of animals to adopt was a good thing. But today, he stood second in line and felt confident that the odds were in his favor of finding a puppy. After reviewing the preliminary paperwork David filled out, the shelter technician, Gina, introduced herself and performed a brief adoption interview. Have you ever had a pet before? No. Not even as a kid? No, my mother wouldn't allow it. Do you own your home or rent? I have an apartment that I rent. Have you contacted your landlord about your potentially adopting a pet? Yes, I have. I just have to pay more rent and give him an extra security deposit. Can you afford to have a pet? Beyond pet rent, there is food, take care of vet bills. Well, the company I work for, they're giving me a stipend to adopt a pet since I'm working from home because of the pandemic. Great, a lot of companies have stepped up like that. It's a good thing for everyone. Okay, last two questions, dog or cat. And why do you want to adopt a pet? David answered as quickly as he had the others, dog and to have a friend. Okay, there's a lot of friends that need homes here. But before I take you to the kennel floor, there are some ground rules you'll have to follow. David nodded. First, you must tour the entire facility. Every adoptee is special in their own way. And you may catch a spark that you wouldn't find if you picked the first pet you saw. David nodded again. He didn't care what the rules were. He toured the facility 10 times if it meant he'd walk out with a puppy. Second, I'm going to be beside you the entire time for the safety of you and the animals. Of course. Okay, then follow me. David was led down a hall and through large double doors that opened into an expansive space sectioned by dividing walls made of steel kennels. Runs lined the perimeter that housed bigger dogs, Rottweilers, pit bulls, German shepherds. Smaller dogs occupied the kennels stacked two deep, four tall, and 15 wide. The animals seemed to sense a change in the air and reacted by barking, yowling, or whining, anything to get the attention of the people who walked into the room. You've got the floor to yourself for 15 minutes. Let me know if you have any questions. David nodded his head. His heart thumped against his chest and he wasn't sure exactly where to start. Puppies. What was that? I mean, do you have any puppies? Gina laughed. Everyone always wants the puppies. They forget the puppies turn into the ones barking along the walls and in the kennels. Follow me, but don't forget about rule number one. David walked along the wall of kennels. He'd never seen so many varieties of dogs in one place. He counted a row of 10 chihuahuas, a maze that no two looked alike. Their markings, color, size, shape, all different snowflakes fallen from the same cloud. Okay, here are the puppies, how about it? David spent 10 minutes playing with several puppies, but something wasn't right. They were too innocent, too new. As a kid, he wanted nothing more than to have one, but now that he was older, it didn't fit. Meandering down the line of kennels, he passed a Jack Russell. It was the only quiet dog in the building. He paused at the realization, then retreated a step back. That's Gunther, Gina said, stepping towards the kennel. He's a sweetheart. David studied Gunther for a minute. A brown patch of hair covered his left eye and the base of his tail, but otherwise he was white with flecks of gray on his muzzle. His dark eyes drooped and he seemed tired of being stared at inside his kennel. The technician unlatched the door. The clicking metal failed to elicit a reaction in him. 
He's just tired. Let me get a lead on him and we can take him for a walk. With four paws on the ground, Gunther sniffed the air. David walked behind him, allowing Gunther to take him where he pleased. He does seem like he wants to show you something, Sheena said with a coy smile, and I think I know what. Gunther led David to an empty kennel at the end of the dividing wall. He sniffed with deliberate focus, and after seemingly overcome with a sudden realization, he turned up to Gina. Yep, I knew it, Isabella. They were relinquished as a pair, a Jack Russell and a Bichon Prise. Seems like an odd pair, but I guess I've seen Otter. The owner contracted coronavirus and sadly passed away. Her family couldn't keep any pets, so they had to give them up. We tried to adopt them as a pair, but there were no takers. David leaned down and awkwardly patted Gunther's head. Actually, full disclosure, Gina skinned through a document affixed to the clipboard she pulled from Gunther's kennel. He does have a heart murmur. He's not on medication at the moment, but if you want to adopt him, you should get that regularly checked by a veterinarian. Gunther grunted when David lifted him off the ground. He held him in the crook of his arm as he pressed his floppy ear against his chest. See, I've got a hole in my heart too. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Raj. And thank you so much to everyone who, who was able to read today. Thank you as well to Bob and Nancy who could not make it to read with us today. Um, it, this project would not have been possible without all of your, your love and your focus and your dedication to writing. Big thank you to Joe Donnelly, who I see out there for this wonderful cover design that we have here. Thank you so much, that's lovely. Thank you to Claire and to Village Books. Without the generosity and wonderful kindness of the bookstore, this, th these anthologies that we put together as part of the writing groups at Village Books would not be possible. Um, thank you to everyone as well who is here attending to visit. This is a lovely turnout. You all are delightful. I see a lot of faces and people, names that I recognize. It's so good to have you all here. And with that, Claire, I will turn it over to you, I, I believe. Well, um, sure. That, that, I kind of was thinking that now would be a really great time if people want to, if they have any questions or specific comments that they want to make about what they've heard today. Um, now it would be a great time to do that. And you can, if you want, you can unmute mute yourself and, and, and speak speak freely to the to the room or you can just put pop some things into the chat but i for one want to say how much i enjoyed listening to the selections today um this is this is a great collection and um really from what i have heard and the pieces that i have read really quality writing um so i thoroughly enjoyed it so thank you Oh, come on, don't be shy, folks. Sorry, right. we're, we're getting a lot of love. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, David, also. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean. So I, also, I also want to say thank you to David and to Richard for putting this all together and getting it organized for all of us and keeping us all on task. Very yeah. much. Thank you. Well, you know, Richard pitched the idea and David just helped him through the whole gestation. I mean, it was a wonderful thing. Um, um, and it was a great idea because it just was one of those things that just pulled me into like, oh, well, yeah, I can do this, I guess. Um, Susan Grison asked, did we self-edit our work? And the way the process works was very much like the traditional uh, Village Books writing group on Thursday nights. Um, people would do a draft of the story, send it out to the group for comment. We would review three or four stories uh, and give feedback to the authors. They would make revisions. Um, and then, um, oh, David, you can correct me where I screw up and forget, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, after after going through a round of that, people submitted a final draft of their story. And then David and I, uh, well, the, actually it, this is a juried work. Uh, we submitted the stories to uh, the readers who wanted to judge and uh, to, to authors who wanted to judge as well. And we did rank the stories and uh, uh, not all were included. So it is a juried work. So once there are 11 stories in the book, um, when uh, 
we decided which ones were going to actually be published and included in the anthology. David and I started going through with a fine tooth comb. David is a wonderful person to edit with. Um, we had many fun arguments over how many periods form an ellipsis and whether an M dash should be in a bit of Victorian excess or something different. We had great fun. Um, went through several revisions and I have to say, I found the first typo just last week, but fortunately it's on my own story, so nobody can scream at me. Uh, but it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Susan, I know Richard said it and Tom has put it in the chat. There are 11 total stories in the book and the book is only $10, which is a pretty good steal, which means it's less than a dollar a story, folks. And I believe Village Book ships anywhere in the United States for only 99 cents, which you, you can't beat that. It's true, 99 cents. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? We're happy. Where else are you going to get a book of this quality for 10 bucks? Nowhere. <laughs> Absolutely no. I mean, the library will give it to you for free, but this is not in the library. You can't get it. Yep. And I also would like to echo what David said about the, um, about the cover. Joe, fabulous work on the cover. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I really like it. So. Thank you. Um, how often do you folks meet now? That's a great it was, question. It was, one, it was once, it was twice a month at the bookstore, right? Yeah, so, so Fiction 1 and 2 are both still meeting uh, twice a month. There are also um, poetry and nonfiction and prompts groups. I, the prompts is the only one that I'm not sure is still meeting virtually, but all of them are still meeting virtually. If any of you are interested in attending them, um, I'll put my email in the chat and you can shoot me an email asking about it. Um, you can also, if you if you email anyone at Village Books, I, I worked there about four years ago now, I think, for, for a couple of years. And um, and I'm still the contact person for all of the group organization. People say, excuse me, do you know, do you know who like how do I get into the poetry group? I'm like, well, I don't run it, but I can give you the email addresses of both people involved. So uh, what what I what I love is that um you can say that Paul Hansen is the contact and then people will contact Paul Hansen. He will say, you can contact David Beaumier. And yeah. <laughs> that, that has happened before. <laughs> and the, the, the main thing is I, I, I've just asked the Village Books doesn't put my email on their website because I don't, I don't want rant, people have to put in a little bit of effort before they, they find the right switchboard to get to the writing groups. And we appreciate your, um, and people can just contact me at events at villagebooks.com because you were kind enough to give me the, the contacts for each group, so. Oh, and you um, saved it. Of course. That's, I gave it to Paul too. <laughs> but we shall not, we shall, shall not speak ill of our patrons before they are generous no. and kind. No, <laughs> it's true. All right. Um, and I would do want to make sure that everybody knows that this recording is actually going to be on our YouTube channel, uh, probably not until maybe tomorrow, but um, there's the link in the chat to our YouTube channel. I encourage everyone there, everyone to subscribe to the Village Books YouTube channel because all of our events are there. If you missed any of our past events and we have, we've hosted some pretty terrific authors in the last year on, on this in this format. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to check it out. Um, so, and so there's that. I, I don't, I don't know quite how the pandemic has affected this for you, but pre pandemic, I know village books did over 300 free events a year. They, for them, this is really a labor of love. These books are a great way to support them. I know there's a donate link on the event, right? I, I really cannot speak more highly of, uh, uh, of a place to, to get, give some money to. And I don't say that about everywhere I've worked, believe me. Thank you. <laughs> we, we do appreciate it. It's, yeah, challenging times for everyone, as we all know, so. Well, I think we're, we're at a good point to, to say farewell so long, a Peter Shen, goodbye. Thank you well, to everyone for coming. It's great to see friends and family here. Yeah, thanks for all the work that went into this. Good to see everyone, nice to hear everyone. Love you guys in the group. Thanks so much. And thank you, editors. Yes. Ah, yes. All of you. Damn you and love you.
<laughs> but, well, two. Let, let me get my blue pencil, Tom. You forgot a semicolon. <laughs> I hope not. I was in charge of Tom's proofing. <laughs> <laughs> That's Good night, everyone. Thanks, Claire. Good night. All right. With that, we'll, we will sign off. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>